Hello fellow word lovers, welcome to Pocket of Poetry. My name is Olivia and today I'm going to be talking about my top 10 favorite books that I read in 2020. I don't know about you, but I read a lot this year. I feel like quarantine was very conducive to reading a lot of books. And as you will see from this list, I love historical fiction. I love my historical romances, my historical dramas, and a lot of con there's a few contemporary and nonfiction mixed in there as well. So you'll be able to kind of get a good sampling of what my reading taste is like. So without further ado, the first book that I wanted to talk about was The Romanov Empress by C.W. Gortner. This is a book that I checked out from the library a couple of weeks ago and really found myself enjoying. Um, I don't know if any of you ever read those Royal Diary series when you were younger, but I used to always go to the library and get those fictional diaries written about real princesses from history, and I loved them. I thought they were so fun. I've always loved learning about real royalty, and this novel is about the Tsarina Maria Fyodorovna. She was Nicholas II's mother, the last Tsar of Russia. And it was super interesting to read about her life and what a strong and resilient woman she was, how much she went through, and what her role kind of was in the final days of the Imperial, um, of Imperial Russia. So the writing in this book was a bit clunky at times. I won't say it was the best writing I've ever read, but if you are looking for a really educational, but also lushly descriptive, immersive experience to kind of learn about that period of history, I would really recommend this book. Number nine for me this year was Christy by Katherine Marshall. It's a book that I read before, but one that's a total classic for me because I keep coming back to it and learning new things from it. Um, Christy is a book about a young girl who travels from her luxurious life in Asheville, North Carolina and goes to a region of the Appalachian Mountains to teach school to the mountain people there. And while she's there, she learns a lot about the world, about herself, about her beliefs, and she comes to love these mountain people who have slightly backward traditions. They're living in a very poor community and she learns to love these people and to serve them and teach them um, and kind of dedicates her life to a cause. And honestly, this book is so inspiring to me for so many reasons. I love the story of a young girl coming of age, finding a purpose, finding a calling. And Christy goes through so much she learns her identity so much throughout the book. So like I said, it is very much a coming of age story. There's a lot of themes of religion in this book as well. There's a character who's kind of a mentor to Christy called Miss Alice Henderson. And the scenes with Alice Henderson are some of the best scenes. She just mentors Christy and teaches her. One thing that I really like about Christy is the fact that it doesn't gloss over hard topics. You know, things like rape, sexual abuse, and violence are all addressed in this book, but they're addressed through the eyes of a young girl who's disillusioned, who is sheltered and innocent, but then comes to realize the darkness of the world. You know, you kind of go through that process with her of, oh my gosh, the world is this dark, horrible place, what can I do? And then over time, she starts to realize she has a place in it and she can change the world in her own small way. And so I just, I always find this book to be so inspiring. Um, I find it to just be a really wholesome, wonderful book that teaches me so much every time. I love the scenes where she talks about or where she's teaching the kids. Um, she, you know, she teaches in this small school with these mountain children who so many of them are starved for affection, starved for love, and just some of the parts in the book where she's able to connect with the kids were some of my favorite parts because I've always loved teaching and education is kind of a passion of mine. And so I find those scenes to be very heartfelt and very moving. So. Christy is one that I just really, really enjoyed. I put it lower down on my list mostly because um, it's very meaningful to me personally, but I don't know how many other people would enjoy it. Book number eight, the next book that I wanted to talk about is 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. I do have a copy of it here. I don't have a copy of a lot of my books, but I do have this one. Um, this book, if you don't know what it is, is a series of 12 essays written by psychologist Jordan B. Peterson, um, where he talks about 12 ways to make life better, to improve your own mental state, and to improve the world. So just a quick sampling of a couple of the rules. Um, rule number one is stand up straight with your shoulders back. He talks about being confident and kind of, in a way, attracting what you want into life through confidence. Um, kind of a basic principle, but he, he explains things very well. And he's very logical and straightforward in the way that he writes. So much so that he takes you through a whole mental journey and there's certain rules like you know tell the truth or at least don't lie or he has pursue what is meaningful not what is expedient 
Um, one of my favorites, rule number six, was set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. So he just has rules like that that seem, you know, in, in certain aspects seem very simple. What I found most interesting about this book is how he'll take you through the opposite side of his argument. So he's looked at viewpoints and worldviews of people who are anarchists, terrorists, just want to watch the world burn because they think it's a horrible place, and he'll walk you through their point of view and what they see, and he'll actually show you the validity and the truth in even the worst of arguments. Um, but then he'll flip it around on you and say, well, this is where that, you know, if you follow this argument, that's where it's going to lead you. And if you instead go here, then it will lead you here. And so he just, he takes you through this whole mental exercise. And this book, I will say, it's, you definitely have to read it slowly in order to kind of digest it because there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of really deep stuff in here. And it took me an entire month to read this book. And I will say I'm kind of a fast reader, so it's not very uh, common for it to take a month for me to read a book. But this one did just because it was, I was just trying to digest and absorb as much of it as I could. So this is one of only two nonfiction books that I have on this list, but I had to include it because I found his writing so amazing. I found the book itself so intriguing and interesting and his principles and his logic honestly just really sound. So number seven was Big Little Lies by Leanne Moriarty. I discovered Leanne Moriarty's books this year and I totally fell in love with her writing style. She has such an incredible dynamic way of drawing you in with awesome character development and plots that just, she writes about real life, but there's always an undertone, a dark undertone to it, just like there is in real life. And I love the way that she writes about these topics and but creates these characters that are so real. So Big Little Lies, if you don't know, um, is a novel about three women. Their names are Madeline, Celeste, and Jane. And each one of these women has a very different life, but the three of them get drawn together as friends. And the beginning of the book, um, there's kind of a murder hinted at. So from the very beginning of the book, you know that something dark happened. Um, the whole time, you know there's this kind of dark mystery, even though at first the book seems all light and fun and cute. It's about these three women who are all moms. Madeline, who is struggling with her teenage daughter. Celeste, who has a seemingly perfect marriage and perfect life with her two boys, but is actually struggling with domestic violence from her husband. And Jane, who's a single mom who doesn't know the father of her little boy. So the three of them all get connected. And I, something I really, really enjoyed about this book, minus the awesome characters and just the great writing of Leanne Moriarty, she has excellent writing, um, was the female friendship and the themes of motherhood in the book. Um, I love how the three women were so different, but they all came together and were able to support each other as women. And I also loved how each of them kind of dealt with motherhood differently and had different struggles with motherhood and how that role kind of sat on each of them differently. So I found that to be a really interesting exploration. Again, there are um, topics of sexual assault and domestic violence in this book that are addressed and they're super important topics, but again, just be warned of that if you are going to read this book. But I loved the way it was addressed and dealt with and yeah, definitely has like a lot of twists and turns in the plot that you don't expect. So I really, really enjoyed this book and wanted to include it on this list. Book number six, coincidentally, is Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Um, this is one that... I'm sure you've probably heard discussed before. It's really popular. I've seen a lot of reviews of it. It's the story of a rock band from the 1960s and it's told through a series of interviews. So each of the characters has their own little segments where they're talking about what happened as if they're being interviewed about their past, which I love novels that are written in a unique format like that. I find them so compelling and I love the way that the author was able to tell each story's, each character's story in their own unique voice. I find that so, so impressive when an author can do that. Um, there was a lot that went on in this book and it was very atmospheric of the 1960s, very atmospheric of like the rock scene. There's a lot of uh, drugs in there, drug addiction themes uh, discussed. But probably my favorite aspect of the book was, I would say the three, probably the three main characters. There's kind of a love triangle between Billy, the main character who's this, the head singer in the band. He's this creative genius who struggles with a lot of demons and it brings him down a lot of dark paths in his life. Daisy Jones is kind of a wild child. She just wants to be free. She just wants to live her life, not let anyone tell her what to do. And it obviously gets her into some trouble and she kind of learns throughout the story um, and changes her ways. And then there's Camilla, Billy's wife. And I loved 
Camilla's character. She was just this sweet, supportive, loyal. Um, she was loyal to Billy and she was loving to him throughout all of his struggles and all of his trials. And I just really appreciated the portrayal of their relationship. I thought that it was so human and so real. Just the struggles that they went through and the things that they, the ups and downs that they had to go through, but they still had this love that was just beautiful and they were able to be happy together. So, so book number five, smack dab in the middle, we have one that I actually purchased. I didn't purchase very many books this year, but I did this one, The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. And isn't the cover cute? Um, I adore this book. I love Oscar Wilde so much. His writing is incredible, so beautiful and descriptive and poetic. And The Picture of Dorian Gray, if you don't know, is a story about a beautiful young boy who is, everyone always comments on how gorgeous he is and he's very vain of his appearance. And one day he gets this beautiful portrait painted of him and he makes a wish that the portrait will age and become decrepit and gross instead of him and that he'll stay young. And his wish gets granted and as he goes throughout his life and becomes this corrupt character and sins and does all these terrible things, the portrait takes on his ugliness and his sinfulness and his age and he stays pure and innocent. And so it's very much a, you know, an allegory, a moral, a very, it has a very clear moral to it. Um, but it, it has this lush descriptiveness and this kind of eerie darkness to it. Um, it's very beautifully written and very poetic and flowery, but beneath it all, you get the sense that, you know, something is wrong. That just like that dark, eerie sense that I feel like is so fun to have in books like this. Um, and it has, you know, some very likable characters too. Dorian has a friend, Lord Henry, who kind of is a really bad influence on him and corrupts him. He's a very hedonistic guy. He likes to just seek pleasure. Um, but he is a very, he's a very likable character and there's some very fun quotes and witty banter in this book. Overall, it's just a very intellectual experience when you read it. You feel very intellectual and very educated, but you also get that entertainment factor and it's just honestly an excellent piece of literature that I would think everybody should read. Number four was my second nonfiction book on this list, and that is The Element by Ken Robinson. This book will always have a special place in my heart. I absolutely adore it. Basically, Ken Robinson believes that the element is a, something that every single person on this earth has, and it's a place where your passion and your purpose come together. And when you find the element, you find the thing that brings you the most joy, the most fulfillment, the thing that you're happiest when you're doing, and that brings the most value to the world. It also talks about education, the education system and educational reform a lot in this book. And he talks about how the hierarchy of subjects in our school system is all wrong because we value math and science and literature and English above subjects, creative subjects like art, music, dance, theater, those types of things. And he says, you know, there are different kinds of intelligence and as a society, we value certain kinds of intelligence more than other kinds of intelligence. But in reality, all intelligences are equal and all intelligences have equal value and import to society. So I just love the way that he thinks. I love his mind. I love the ideas that he has about educational reform and about how all of humanity and everybody is so unique. Our entire, you know, the landscape of human life is like a tapestry and there's so many different threads weaving to make, you know, to make the whole big picture. And we need to be valuing every piece of that puzzle equally because each piece is important. I love his philosophies and I think everybody should read The Element because truly he has some great ideas about the future and just about the way that we should be running education and the way that we should be preparing people for their careers and their futures. Book number three for me this year was The Help by Katherine Stockett. This is a classic. Everybody knows The Help. Everybody knows what it's about, but I'll give a very, very brief summary. Um, basically, it follows the stories of three women. Abilene and Minnie are two women who are African-American maids in the South in the 1960s, and so they are obviously very oppressed by the families that they work for, and they're not, you know, treated as equals to the white families, even though they are sacrificing so much for these white children and basically raising them and loving them as their own. And then there's a young white woman named Skeeter who decides that she wants to write a book. Um, one of my favorite tropes in literature is when there's like a main character who's a writer because I'm a writer and I feel like a lot of people who enjoy books are also like aspiring writers. And so it's kind of a trope that appeals to a lot of people. And I really enjoyed um, watching Skeeter kind of go through her journey of trying to become a writer and figure out what she wants to write about. But eventually she decides that she wants to write a book about these 
uh, African American maids and their experiences and what they go through. And she's able to tell their story, even though, you know, it's kind of a dangerous thing to do. So I just, the whole book is incredibly well written. It's incredibly well written. It's such a compelling story. The characters are amazing. I was so drawn into it from the very beginning. And it's obviously such an important story to tell in today's world. It's such an important thing to remember. And, you know, it's, it talks about racism and oppression and it discusses all of those topics that are so important. Um, and I know that there has been like some controversy about the book and the movie and everything, but in and of itself, the writing in this book is incredible. And I really do think it's a book that everyone should read because it just, it's such an amazing and beautiful illustration of humanity and compassion and, you know, a time in history that is very important to remember because there were so many women that did have to go through, so many people that did have to go through things like what happened in this book. And it's so important to remember those. Number two for me, in 2020 was Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. Now, it's basically, if you love sweeping historical dramas, this book is the sweeping historical drama of all historical dramas. Like, it is incredible. I, everybody knows Gone with the Wind is a classic, but it's just written so amazingly. It's got, you've got hoop skirts, you've got battle scenes, you've got, you know, dreamy Southern men. It basically has it all. And Scarlett O'Hara is such an iconic character. I know she's controversial. I know we love to hate her. She's got some very questionable things that she does throughout the book. But I love the way that the character is able to get you into her head and seeing things the way she sees. She has this very black and white view of the world. She has this very, okay, if I do this, then I get this. So why wouldn't I do this? Like she's she's got this very interesting view on the world. And I love that in the book you can really get into her head and see how she's thinking and why she makes the decisions that she does. And honestly, you have to hand it to her because she is an incredibly strong character. She drags her family through the Civil War, through Reconstruction, through all of the crazy stuff that happens in history and their economy going wild. And she is able to just go through all of this stuff and just be so strong and amazing through it all. There's Rhett Butler, who's just the dreamiest man in literature. I mean, how can you not love Rhett Butler? He's just, he's so smooth. Um, and their whole love story is just, honestly, I mean, we, I think most people know how Gone with the Wind ends. I'm obviously not going to say, but I will say that I was bawling and bawling and bawling when I was reading the end of that book because it was just crazy. Um, and like, you feel like you're experiencing the story because it's so long. Like something that I love about long, intense novels like this is that you feel like you're experiencing it along with the character. Like I was listening to most of this on audio and I was just sitting there listening to this long scene uh, describing her like escaping the house and fleeing out of the city. And like, I'm not gonna like go into detail of what happens, but it's this long scene and you feel like you're literally experiencing it with her and going through all of this pain. And because the scene itself is so long and just literally feels like it will never end. So. I will say, obviously, Gone with the Wind is a project. It's an undertaking, but totally worth it. Incredible writing, and I enjoyed it a lot. And the last book that I want to mention, my top book for all of 2020, was The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society by Annie Barrows. This book, we've probably all heard of it. It was made into a movie a couple of years ago. I read it for the first time this year, and honestly, reading this book to me felt like coming home. Like, it was just such a sweet, lovely wholesome read that I just took to heart and just wanted to live in forever. Um, it was written in a unique format. It's written in the form of letters and journal entries throughout the entire thing from different characters. And another thing that I absolutely loved about this book was again, the unique voice of each of the characters. They each had such a distinct voice and it was incredibly well done the way that the author did it. The main character is Juliet Ashton, another writer main character who is a woman who survived the World War II in Great Britain and is now trying to get her writing career back on her feet. She ends up starting a correspondence with a man on the island of Guernsey just through random happenstance and discovering that he and his friends formed a literary society there during the war. Um, and she, be she comes to fall in love with this adorable, quirky cast of characters that inhabit this island. And she decides that she wants to write about the experiences of the inhabitants of Guernsey during World War II. And so she, she discovers all of these stories and all of these interwoven incidents that happened throughout the war and she's able to write a book and anyways the characters in this book are absolutely adorable the writing is so good it's written in a unique format it's a historical novel about world war ii writer main character an adorable romance in there like it literally ticks all of the boxes and it was just such an incredible read for me so 
that concludes my top 10 books of 2020. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video and hearing my thoughts about these books. If you have read any of these books, I would love to hear your thoughts on them down below. If not, let me know what your favorite book was of 2020. And thank you so much for watching this video. I am really excited about this channel. I'm really hoping that it can be a place where people can come together and talk about books and words. And if you liked this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe if you feel like it. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and an amazing new year.